Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord, and risen and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. What a beautiful and wondrous statement that is, and I had planned on repeating it like ten times, but it's already been said about five times in the service. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. What a beautiful and wondrous statement this is. It really is. It seems quite simple, seems like your normal Bible verse, but there's a lot to unpack here. And it's important for us to do so because there's a lot of talk about love in our culture today. And it's often not the same sort of love which is being spoken of in the scriptures. So this verse that was just read begs the question in many of our minds, well, what kind of love is it? That's the phrase that's used, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. So what kind of love is being given to us? Well, to begin, we need to look into the three parts of the verse that really highlight some attributes of what the love of God is. The first is the word father. The second is the phrase children of God. And the third is the last part of the verse, which just simply states, and so we are. So let's start at the first one, the word father. Doesn't seem all that significant. It's not a crazy or new phrase to hear in the context of regular life, much less church life, right? You've heard the phrase, God the Father, Heavenly Father. Maybe you've started your prayers that way. I mean, even the prayer that we're given explicitly by Jesus begins with the words, Our Father. Not only does that highlight the unique relationship that we now have been given to the God of the universe... To be able to address him as father because of what Jesus has done, the very works we just sang about. But it tells us a little bit specifically about what sort of love is being given to us. There's an earthly reflection of this sort of love that we can refer to. Our earthly fathers and mothers, parental love. Now parental love is an imperfect reflection of this, but it gives us enough information to know what the perfect form looks like. So what sort of love does a father or mother have in this life? Well, a father loves you despite who you are. Sort of a crass way to say it, but it's true, right? I heard it sort of humorously expressed that a father said to his son, if you robbed a bank tomorrow, I would still love you, right? A father and a mother love in spite of who you are. And if you want some proof that it's in spite of who you are, just ask them about the first four years of your life. I just spent a good bit of time with my family and my nieces and nephews. I love them dearly, but they are sinners just like you and me. (laughs) And the proof is also at the birth of the baby, right? The father doesn't inspect the child and says, nope, wrong hair color, not mine, or he looks weak or ugly or he cries too much, and I'm not taking him. Right? The father doesn't do that. The father is overwhelmed with joy at the new life that is brought to him, and he loves that life in spite of itself. A father's love also chooses without consent. Sounds weird in our culture today, but let me explain. How many in here got to choose who your dad was? Right? That's not a choice we're given. And yet the Father loves you just the same. It's the same with our relationship with God. Right? He calls us to himself. He creates faith as a gift in us through the works of the Holy Spirit and the means of grace. A Father's love chooses you. He was simply your dad and loved you as a dad does. And by the way, that's the same with adoption on earth as well. Right, adoption is a love that chooses. Now, some people may not have had an earthly father who necessarily loved in this way. And that's a result of sin. 
God intended a father's love and a mother's love to be a great blessing in your life, but sometimes sin gets into our lives in this fallen world and ruins what God intends. But the great message for those of you who had that experience is that you do now have a perfect fatherly love given to you. That is what this verse is expressing. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, a perfect love just for you. So that is a wondrous promise, especially if sin has caused your life and the love and relationship with your parents to not be as God intended. The second phrase to help us determine what kind of love is the phrase children of God. Now there's a little overlap here with the father analysis because we're still looking at the picture of the earthly family as a reflection of God's love. But now we're looking at it from the perspective of the child. So let me describe a few scenarios. There are some good times, right, parents? Playing catch in the backyard. They're doing well in school. They come home and give you a straight A report card. They're getting their chores done, and I didn't even have to ask this time. And in general, they're obeying your wishes. Therefore, you love them. Bad times happen, though, too, don't they, parents? Times when you say, go to your room. Times when they've disappointed you with the way they've behaved, or maybe they hid their report card from you because it wasn't straight A's. Or maybe they made bigger mistakes when they're older, maybe mistakes about sex, or maybe they stayed out too late and broke curfew, or they're not doing their chores and just in general expressing disobedience. Therefore, you love them. Isn't that weird? See, our world describes love as sort of this transactional agreement that, well, I will love you and and agree with you and, and get along with you if X, Y, and Z, whatever it may be, right? There's always a condition attached, and yet God intended the love within the earthly family to reflect his love, which isn't dependent upon conditions. And this, I mean, the fact that I'm standing up here is living proof of that. Right? I didn't get cast out of my home and disowned by my parents every time I did something wrong, which they had plenty of opportunity to do so. Even when I threatened to run away, and I only ever really made it as far as the end of our street, because my dad would always call my bluff and say, well, go somewhere where they won't charge you any money to buy you clothes and feed you and provide you a place to sleep. And really, even though that statement is sort of ironic and funny, it's true. And that's a reflection of the very love we're talking about. There isn't a transaction going on here. There's just a love for who you are. A love in spite of self. Now, do parents sometimes forget this? Yeah, you do. We all do, right? We're sinners. They're imperfect sinners like each one of us. But the good news is God does not. His love is perfect. And so, each week when you come here confessing your sins, confessing your disobedience to him, right, I always sort of have this image in my head that confession at the beginning of the church service is sort of like coming home when you know that they know you did something you weren't supposed to, right? It's like the elephant in the room. You can't just move on from it. It has to be addressed. And so, I always felt that was the reason why we do that at the beginning of the service, right? Because he knows, by the way. He always does. And yet, what is the response every time, regardless of the confession made? Your mind, I love you, your sins are forgiven. And not because of the things you did or didn't do, but because of what my son did, the mercy of Jesus. And that brings us to the last phrase in this verse. And so we are. Now this is, my, in my opinion, this is one of my favorite parts of the verse. I think it's one of the coolest aspects of God. And that is that this statement reflects the sort of the unique nature of love that can only come from God. And that is that it is a declarative love. Because God calls us his children, we actually become his children. Right then and there. That's what we believe happens in baptism. 
God claims you as his own and says you are mine, and you right then and there are his. He declares you his child, and so you are. Remember this very same word that's being spoken to you. This very same word that is claiming you as his own is the same word that said, let there be light. And there was. It is a word that self-creates. It's a word that makes things so. And that same word says to each and every one of you, you are my child. And so you are, period. It makes you so. And once again, it makes you so not on the merits of your life, but on the merits of Christ and what he has done in our stead. So what kind of love has the Father given to us that we should be called children of God and so we are? What wondrous love, just to kind of summarize, it is a love that chooses you. You don't choose it. It is a love that is not conditions-based. Whether you're obedient or disobedient to God, he loves you still the same and pursues you. And it is a love that declares you righteous children of God and simply stated like it does in the verse, and so you are. Believe it. Yet, this is just the first verse of our text today from 1 John chapter 3. It continues on after this profound statement of love from our God. Where does it go? Not just is this love wondrous, but it's something worth keeping. And now the text is going to give us a warning, a caution. Because God's love is so wondrous and continually offered, the caution, the warning is Don't reject it. The phrase that is used in this passage is the practice of sin. The practice of sin equals lawlessness. The practice of sin does not abide in him. The practice of sin is not seen or known. Those who practice it are not seen or known by him. Which brings to mind the verse in the scriptures where you knock on the door and the Lord of the house opens and looks out and says, I do not know you. Wait a minute. Hold on. I thought there wasn't a condition to this wondrous love. So what is all of this talk about sin and lawlessness and not abiding in him? Well, even when you are sinning, even when I am sinning, God's love is still being offered in full, just as it always is. He's still always reaching out continuously, right? The, condi- the, the non-condition part of God's love is that he's always offering it every time, which is why when we come and confess our sins, it is always right there speaking the same sort of love that is being offered here at the beginning of this This passage. Just as when you disobey your earthly parents, they don't stop loving you. They may not really like what you did, and they're going to do their best to try and turn you away from that. But they don't say, you are no longer my son. You are no longer my daughter be gone from me, nor does our heavenly father. His love continually offered without condition. So why all of this talk about sin? The warning here is that a continual practice of sin, that phrase there, practice of sin, is intentional. Right? This isn't referring to the sort of sin we all deal with, that we're, that where Paul shares with us, right? That the thing that I wish I would do is the thing that I'm always not doing, and the thing that I wish I wouldn't do is the thing I always find myself doing. That war inside of us of sinner and saint, of sinful flesh still trying to cling to us. That's not what's being spoken of here. The practice of sin is lawlessness. What do you do when you practice something? When you practice something, you train for it, you plan for it, it's all intentionally done. 
And the practice of sin is the intentional doing of sin, the preparing for sin, the intending to sin. Or used in another phrase, it is the unrepentant state of the human heart. The desire to do sin, the desire to carry it out. And here in 1 John, we're being told that this counts towards a rejection of this love that God seeks to give us. Now, we don't know why he has allowed us to reject it, but the scriptures are clear that it is a possibility. And so we have this warning. Think about it for a moment in the context of your family and earthly relationships. When you disappoint a parent, you know. Nobody has to tell you. Right? When you have bad grades, nobody has to say, oh, you should hide that from your parents. You just instinctively want to. Because not only are you afraid of their disappointment, because you don't want to disappoint them, but you are disappointed in yourself. Yet in that instance, what calls you to truthfulness? Is it your own wisdom? Your own wisdom has led you to turn away from the love of your parents, to not trust that if they see this, that they will still love you. Your own wisdom has told you that if they see it, surely they will no longer love me. Right For me, this was a moment. I, so being a pastor's kid, you're always the last kid to leave after church because your dad's talking, and I'm sure I'm going to do the same thing. So it was a big deal when I got to drive and I could take my dad's car because we always took two cars to church because my dad got here really early and then we came later, which meant that while he's talking, we could take one of the cars home. So I do that. My dad's, I remember, it's a silver Suzuki Esteem and me and my brother are driving home and all of a sudden he had one of those like 15 second just deluge downpours, just enough to get the oils in the road up and a big truck in front of us flipped over on the road and, and slid off the road and then all of a sudden you start seeing all these brake lights and of course it's just when I had turned into the fast lane to pass a car. To be totally honest, I have there's like about a five second period of time where I remember nothing. Somehow, I pulled a James Bond and weaved in and out of cars and only gave this old boat Cadillac a nice bump. And he just drove off. So I was like, okay. But you know what my first thought was? My dad is going to kill me. <laughs> Didn't even notice that the, a cooler full of water had upended in the back seat and was pouring everywhere until we got home. And so I'm coming into the driveway and I'm thinking, surely I'm dead. He's never going to let me drive his car again. And that's what, so all of my thoughts is my dad is going to be concerned about this car. And when he figures out what happens, the first thing he says to me and my brother is, are you okay? He didn't really care about the car. And actually, there were a couple times in my life where I thought I was going to get in the most trouble, and I actually got in the least, because what I thought he would be concerned about was not what he was concerned about. See, what called us to truthfulness, what calls all of us to truthfulness, is our conscience informed by the Holy Spirit. Right, The very gift that Jesus promises in the gospel today causes us to trust in that love, causes us to confess our sins, whether it's to our parents for breaking curfew or to our God here on Sunday morning for whatever has happened in the past week. Trusting that God is unconditionally loving us, continually reaching out, and then it is again proven time and time again with the response, you are mine, your sins are forgiven, I love you. So today, dear brothers and sisters, fellow children of God, rest secure in the knowledge that you are loved by God. He has declared you his own in the waters of holy baptism, a visible promise given for your sake and through his very word, which we heard read today. Yet also take heed to not take up the practice of sinning. Don't resist the urgings of the Holy Spirit when your conscience calls you back to God to confess your sin. Don't reject the love of your Heavenly Father because each time you return home to Him, you will not face His rejection. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
It isn't about your perfection or mine that makes God love you. He simply does. He loves you unconditionally, and his declarative love has made you his child, and so you are. In the name of Jesus, amen.